Hey guys, just quick note before we get into this episode. So this is going to be a more of an interview. So not our conventional review or breakdown of a Pixar film. So we're going to be talking about The Good Dinosaur. But if you haven't seen The Good Dinosaur, I highly recommend you check it out before you listen to this episode. But if you haven't seen it before and you still want to listen to this episode, quick premise. It's about a dinosaur living in an alternate timeline where the dinosaurs never died. And he's a young son of a farming family. He gets lost in the wilderness. He befriends a small human named Spot and Arlo, that's the main character, and Spot go on this adventure where they encounter all kinds of different dinosaurs, both good and bad. And then they eventually find their way home. So if anything in this podcast sounds out of context, it would benefit you to watch the film. You are here to enter. Welcome to Pizza Planet. Welcome to Pizza Planet, a Pixar podcast. I'm Ben. And I'm Gareth. And, and we're, we're your, your delivery, delivery guys. guys. Bringing you a square box of round, hot, cheesy Pixar goodness. Mm-hmm. We've got a bounty of slices in today's feast, so let's dig in. Welcome to Pizza Planet. We are back. Yeah, yeah. We are back. We were out in space. Now we're back on the planet. The planet made a pizza. Oh, yeah. There's pepperonis flying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we can feel the squishy cheese under our feet. Yeah, y'all feel that out there? No. Um, hey, guys. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Today, uh, we are doing an episode on a new series we're calling Casting the Lamplight, where we interview um, people who have just expertise in a certain topic that crosses over with uh, Pixar stuff. And today, we're casting the lamplight on our friend Anders Visser. Hey, what's up? Thank you guys for letting me be in on this. So. Hopefully, be <laughs> hope this will go well. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here. Anders is a dinosaur expert. Yes, he is. Uh, he has a YouTube channel called um, Hoops and Dino Man. Very successful channel on, on where he does all kinds of dinosaur um, stuff on there. Um, he analyzes dinosaur movies. He even does his own stop motion films, which are incredible. I love them. Highly recommend them. But yeah, man, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks. I, I don't know if I'd consider myself an expert, but thank you for... I didn't go to school for it, but, you know, I'm a you're, big enthusiast for sure. You're an expert on dinosaur movies, though. We, we sure. could I think we could say that with confidence, because uh, if you haven't guessed, well, you probably can tell from the title, Anders is here specifically for us to pick his brain about The Good Dinosaur, Pixar's dinosaur movie. So just some quick stats for you, uh, like we normally... Um, like to talk about at the top of every episode. The Good Dinosaur, just as a quick overview, it was directed by Peter Sohn, who directed Partly Cloudy and the upcoming movie Elemental. This movie starred Raymond Oka, Jack Bright, Jeffrey Wright, Francis McDormand, Peter Sohn, Steve Zahn, A.J. Buckley, Anna Paquin, and Sam Elliott. This movie was released November 25th, 2015. Amongst all the Pixar movies, this movie ranked 21st in the uh, box office. It grossed opening weekend 39 million. D- domestic box office was 123 million. Worldwide, 332. And then uh, this movie had a budget of 187 million. So it was successful financially. Um, but critically, it ranks number 23 of all 25 Pixar films. Oof. So it has a rating of 76% on uh, Rotten Tomatoes. That's with 220 reviews. So it is considered to be one of the worst Pixar movies, critically. But um, regardless, it is a movie about dinosaurs. So we brought (laughs) Anders in to talk about it. Yes, yeah. And and real quick, so Anders is just a really good friend of ours, too. We go back. um, I met Anders at a movie theater Years ago, we worked together. Um, it was one of those movie theaters where it's like the you know dollar theater, where it's like after the after a movie leaves the prime theater, it goes into this theater. Um, it's closed down now, so R.I.P. But uh, but yeah, that's where we met Anders, and we've done we've just been friends over the years with Gareth as well. All three of us have been friends, and um, we actually made some films together with our filmmaking group called Idiot Box Films. It's shameless plug. Yeah, check us out. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so so Anders has been with us for a while, and yeah, as we said, he's an expert on on dinosaurs. So we had to have him on the show to talk about the good dinosaur. So yeah, man. Well, hey, we we want to get some background info on yourself and your channel. 
Well, um, my channel is Hoops and Dino Man. I made it back in 2008, so it's been a while. Uh, I started out um, just uh, making stuff with toys like, you know, kids would do back then. And uh, I, I really liked watching uh, a lot of stop motion uh, toy stuff on YouTube. That was what got me into uh, making videos back in the day. And so I made some of my own. I found some success with my toy stuff uh, back then. And uh, I met a lot of people who uh, also uh, made similar uh, videos to mine, who I'm still friends with to this day. And they're, it's pretty fun to do. Right now what I'm doing is I'm using my channel to post uh, basically just what I feel like. I, I'm still into dinosaur stuff a lot. So I am working on claymation shorts mostly so a uh, real passion project of mine for a while has been trying to uh, capture this feeling that I sort of get a vibe from old dinosaur movies and shows mm -hmm. where there's this certain aesthetic that's sort of combined from old recordings of like music and how it degrades over the time and uh, same thing with like visuals on film so there's a certain look and a certain mood that I'm trying to capture with my uh, stop motion shorts that I got from old dinosaur movies, like say Fantasia or something like that. Uh, and I did a whole video on that where I try to put that into words. And I am also trying to be creative and up to date scientifically with uh, the stuff I have my dinosaurs do in my short videos. Mm -hmm. So try to combine best of both worlds with those with those sorts of things. Mm. But I'll also, um, in the past, I also did uh, videos where I review dinosaur movies and shows that I like, and people seem to like hearing what I have to say on those, <laughs> but you know, it's probably what got me here, so. <laughs> yeah, man, awesome. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Well, getting started with uh, our discussion of the good dinosaur, we'd like to hear some of your initial thoughts on the design for the dinosaurs in this movie. As someone who has worked in stop motion, which is technically animation, hey. uh, so you've made animated dinosaur movies before. So this kind of makes you, in our minds, an authority on this. What What are your thoughts on the des character designs for the dinosaurs in this this Pixar movie? I wasn't the biggest fan of them, to be perfectly <laughs> honest with you. Uh, be just, as brutally honest yeah. as you want. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I know. I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm just an amateur, but, you know, just making observations. Um, one thing that stuck out to me the most was the uh, design of the characters uh, seemed kind of, what's the word? Not not quite the same as uh, the aesthetic they're going with with the backgrounds which mm. were they are trying to look very hyper real with the backgrounds and plants in the animation with this yeah and then they've got the the dinosaurs that seem very like g-rated cartoony uh tv show uh, sort of designs yeah. they've got obvious you know cartoon things like uh human-like eyes and stuff like that which is kind of expected but they've also mm. got some weird disproportionate body features like the main apatosauruses have like big blocky feet their wrists are bent really far forward and like hmm. and uh the snouts and mouths are really disproportionate so there's it's definitely a lot to get used to for sure hmm. i'm not sure if uh they had to go that route with the art direction but you know that was a uh, something that stuck out to me but i guess what you want to know is uh accuracy stuff or how it compares to other dinosaur media that i've seen and the stuff i do with that regard um it's uh, it's quite a lot. There's some stuff in it that's sort of accurate, but at other times, and it's really outdated stuff. Like uh, the raptors, for instance, with their feather coverage is almost completely lacking. And there's a weird thing with the T-Rexes where their uh, teeth are sticking out in some of them, which is another... Uh, outdated uh, cliche mm. and you know it's a whole thing <laughs> i don't know how long <laughs> yeah. you want me to dwell no. on just one answer but uh no that's that's I really could go fascinating through it point by point if you well, would but. It's, well i mean we might be going point by point later on yeah. um i i will say just to respond to one thing you said and this is more for the audience's benefit i don't know how many people know this but the environments in the good dinosaur were actually animated years before the characters were and that's why the environments look hyper realistic <laughs> 
um, and why there's a contrast between the characters and environments, as, as Ben knows, they actually had a completely different movie planned originally. Mm -hmm. um, they had a different cast, like Lucas Neff played Arlo originally, uh, and they had like John Lithgow, I think, played his dad. And they had like a completely different cast. And then when they got Peter Sohn on the project, he did a rehaul of the story, oh, yeah. but they retained all the same like like uh, environments and assets for for the film. So they had way more time on on the environments, and that's why there's such a stark contrast there. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah, because it is like ridiculously realistic, and then yeah. you have the yeah, like you said, the cartoony vibe, and yeah, it's, we'll definitely have to pick your brain on this as as we go through about just the idea of like. You know, when it comes to a dinosaur film, like you've got, you know, the, the realistic approach versus the artistic liberty mm -hmm. approach, which is which is interesting. So we wanted to um, kind of like just walk through each dinosaur species with you mm -hmm. and you kind of point out a couple, but kind of like just take them at it as a time. And you can because I, I don't know dinosaur species. I, so. think, <laughs> I think there's five different species we see in this mm -hmm. movie, if I'm remembering correctly. Arlo, you said he's a I'm guessing they're supposed to be apatosauruses just because they're the famous ones okay yeah <laughs> I, I did a google search uh like yeah. just a little bit ago and that is you're right it's yeah it's, i thought it was a a, a bro brocchi or bron brachiosaurus yeah, yeah i initially I it was but i had initially thought that too but then i was like i think brachiosaurus have like a weird shaped head or something like mm -hmm. that this must be something different i've never heard a potosaurus before but so um, so arlo is a is it a, a potosaurus what we, that's what, what they say you know they never say what is movies, what is so. the difference between an apatosaurus and a brachiosaurus Okay, so an apatosaurus um, is part of a completely different group. I mean, there, there's the larger group of them. I don't know my terminology on this one. There's okay. uh, clade, there's suborder, but, you know, like yeah. there's a larger uh, group that includes both of those. It's called sauropods, which mm. uh, means lizard feet, which is all the dinosaurs that are quadrupedal. They have long necks and tails, and they're herbivores. And... Then there's uh, two separate groups. Uh, Apatosaurus is part of one. Brachiosaurus is part of another one. Biggest difference is Brachiosaurus has this uh, giraffe-like body plan where the front legs are way longer. It sticks more. It sticks its head more up into the air, and it also has a much shorter tail. Oh, and okay. with Apatosaurus, it's part of a group of dinosaurs that had uh, way longer tails. Their tails ended in uh, whips almost. Uh, and it's possible that they held their necks uh, higher up like Brachiosaurus, but also it's hypothesized or theorized, I should say, because there's more thought put into it, that uh, they had their necks parallel to the ground instead. So they... It just depends on which uh, trees they probably favored, if they wanted uh, something more low-lying or something uh, mm -hmm. higher up. They both lived at like the same time, so personally, uh, and I've said on this before when I did a video on these dinosaurs, it's like, personally, I think that the if they both lived at the same time, c competing with each other for the same food source might become a problem, so... Apatosaurus eating lower lying uh, plants than Brachiosaurus probably would have allowed them to coexist, but that's just my opinion. Mm. I think that uh, clearly in this movie they're going for a more Brachiosaur giraffe type stance uh, with them. So yeah, but their tails are also like way way shorter than uh, an actual uh, an Apatosaurus would be, mm. which was one of the uh, many details they kind of missed about a lot of them mm. in there. For sure. Hmm. Interesting. So I think that the second species that we see of dinosaur in the film is correct the pronunciation if this is right or wrong. Styracosaurus. The Styracosaurus. Styracosaurus. There it could be. Uh, <laughs> it seems like they just kind of like made an amalgam of a bunch of ceratopsid dinosaurs, which are the ones that have big horns and frills, because it's got a Styracosaurus uh, frill that has a bunch of spikes sticking out of it, but it also seems to have like Triceratops horns. Hmm. So they've kind of made something that doesn't exist, and that's not entirely bad because like. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet. I'm sure everybody listening knows the concept, but the premise of this movie is that it's an alternate timeline where dinosaurs didn't, uh, like the Cretaceous extinction event didn't happen. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be perfectly honest, I don't think they do enough with that concept in the movie because they kind of have uh, yeah. dinosaurs that are just the same instead uh, of uh, speculating on what they devolve into. Oh, that's interesting. And, uh, yeah. Because, you know, 
plant life and weather and stuff is way different nowadays than in you know hundreds of millions of years ago. Yeah, and they could have done a lot more with that uh, creatively, uh, but it's mostly just uh, basing their designs off of already known dinosaurs. Sure. But in terms of this uh, made up ceratopsid that they have here. Um, I thought that it was kind of cool what they did with the camouflage uh, thing because it's supposed to be blending in with these birch trees. Mm -hmm. Although I think that the frill and the horns probably would have popped more visually in real life because that was its display structure, which I'm trying to think of another animal that could be used as an example of that, like a cassowaries or a lot of brightly colored birds. Mm. Uh, They use bright colors to attract mates or to to scare off rivals and a ceratopsid with a frill that's like just kind of a bland color and the same as the rest of its body doesn't really make a whole lot of sense Hmm. uh, because it's it's very likely that dinosaurs saw in color because their closest relatives are birds and crocodilians Hmm. so they're not like mammals so it wouldn't be like uh, moose antlers where they're just like one color, which works fine for them. In all likelihood, that probably could have done more with the colors on that frill. But I do like what they did with um, all the other smaller animals riding on his head. Oh, yeah. Because that's definitely There's... something that happens in real life. You know, smaller animals hitching a ride on big animals <laughs> and eating their parasites and, you know, yeah. getting a free ride. And I was going to say, you're you're talking about the way they kind of fabricated or the character was kind of an amalgamation, I think you called it, mm-hmm. of different ideas that we know about the mm-hmm. species. And so it's like, I feel like you kind of see the same thing in those creatures because there's like a saber tooth beaver or something. Yeah, and, yeah. They did yeah. some cool stuff like that with like uh, minor characters that appear here and there. Like yeah. there's also a snake creature that's sort of like a transition uh, that still has the limbs which is real because snakes evolved from lizards and there have been uh, fossils of transitionary snakes with smaller limbs still being attached. So that uh, I thought was a nice little touch. Yeah, I was going to comment about the the walking cobra. I I don't want to say anything I shouldn't on the podcast, but I actually am a young earth creationist, so I don't believe in evolution, but I do believe that snakes used to have legs. So that also I found very interesting. (laughs) Checks out for Gareth. (laughs) So so for the audience sake, let's make sure we uh, explain like what characters we're talking about. So when you're talking about the the species you're talking about right now, the sty- steer- Styracosaurus. <laughs> Can you say it for us, Anders? Styracosaurus is the way that one is pronounced. Okay. I don't know what they're going for with he's that guy. He's the pet collector. Yeah, he's the pet. He's collector. He's the pet collector, and he's the guy who like talks slowly. And his eyes are kind of. He's, he's voiced by Peter Stone, the director. Mm-hmm. Oh, nice. So does he have a name? I don't know if the character has a name. Pet we... collector. Oh, is how he's, he's credited. pet collector. Okay, it's how he's credited. Okay, so we're, let's walk walking through here. So Arlo and his family are apatosauruses. <laughs> I'm going to assume. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. that is the intentional. They're the intended species. Yeah, right? uh, the pet collector is, is Styracosaurus. <laughs> Styracosaurus. Okay. And so, then... oh wait, before we go on to the next one, at the very beginning of the film, uh, Andres, you talked about when the asteroid misses the Earth. We mm-hmm. do see some. Dinosaurs oh, silhouetted I, a little bit. I didn't mm-hmm. think about that. Those are the one with that with the head where like it shapes back their head. Yeah, it looks like what they were doing there. They have uh, some kind of sauropod and also a Parasaurolophus, which is the dinosaur that has you know the elongated uh, crest sticking out of the back of its head. Isn't that what Ducky is supposed to be? I think so. From Land Before Time. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, for, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. And then, so the next species we see in the movie are the flying guys. Those yeah, the are the pterosaurs. That's the name of the whole group. I think that the ones that were in this one are supposed to be uh, pteranodons and. Uh, the main one is a Nyctosaurus, okay. which is, I think they're probably the most inaccurate ones in there. Uh, the raptors are a close second, but we'll get to that. <laughs> now, now by flying ones, you guys are talking about the evil uh, yeah. Yeah, flying Steve, dice. Steve's on. Yes, mm-hmm. okay. Yeah, all right. yeah, so this is kind of a, a point in the movie where I was like sidetracking here, but when I watched this movie, I was also thinking about Finding Nemo mm. and how what they were trying to use the story as a means to show off a whole bunch of sea creatures. And it's, if you watch the movie, you can tell that they put like a lot of research into Mm. trying to 
come up with little uh, gags to have fun with sort of things that these animals do. Like they have a, a joke of Nemo like has to brush, like brushing his teeth in the morning, but it's uh, the thing where clownfish rub against uh, sea anemone tentacles oh, yes. in order to produce uh, mucus that keeps them from getting stung. And there's a whole bunch of stuff like that throughout the movie. And it kind of shows you this attention to detail that they mm-hmm. put a lot of thought into uh, their subject matter. I didn't really get that kind of vibe from this movie uh, because it seemed like they just kind of took the most basic dinosaurs everyone knows about that they probably knew about Mm. and just animated them the way that, you know, people generally uh, think of them as. Mm. But there's a lot of things that uh, they kind of missed uh, by not looking further into it because with pterosaurs in particular there's a lot of new facts that have been known about them since uh, their discovery and one thing is that they were really fuzzy they had uh, stuff on them that's not fur, it's not feathers, it's called uh, pycna fibers and there have been fossils that have shown that so they weren't entirely scaly like they are in this movie and there's also um, uh, this is not as significant, but you can. There are shots where you can tell, like the wings are sort of like attached and are like supposed to be the same structure as like their tail, mm. uh, but really the wing membranes attached to their uh, feet instead. I know that's really getting nitpicky, but yeah, <laughs> you know. Huh. But uh, there's also this one made no sense of them like grabbing uh, prey with their feet, like birds of prey, Mm -hmm. which they did not do. They're not related to uh, eagles or hawks or whatever. Their feet were just used for walking. They grabbed food with their mouths instead. So, Uh, and they also gave them teeth, which uh, those particular ones did not have teeth. I know that makes them look scarier, but uh, (laughs) a lot of weird stuff in there. Uh, So they're not pterodactyls. Pterodactyl is a kind of pterosaur that's uh, oh. particularly small that they didn't have in this one. Uh, okay. I don't blame them. And that was mostly just a small little uh, fish eater or insect eater that wouldn't have been very threatening. So they went with oh. bigger ones, okay. which made sense, I guess. There were bigger ones that they could have uh, shown in there because there's a group of pterosaurs called Asdarkids that were super tall. They were like taller than giraffes when they were standing on all fours. Oh, yikes. And uh, they actually (laughs) ate small dinosaurs and uh, a few like larger creatures. So if they made those guys like uh, the the villains for this one, it probably could have worked out and could have been a chance to see some creatures not usually seen in, mm, yeah. in dinosaur movies and stuff, but you know. Well, the the scene with the, sorry, the species again. Well, um, uh, I guess the main one is supposed to be a Nyctosaurus because of the shape of its head crest, okay. and the other ones are pteranodons. Okay, so yeah, I, well, the Nyctosaurus eating the critter was yeah. thunderclap. Yeah. Was terrifying enough. Okay, <laughs> that was pretty creepy. That was that <laughs> was the moment when I first saw this film in theaters. That was the moment where I checked out. I was like, yeah, this is. This is unsettling for being an adult. <laughs> an adult who can handle a lot. I can't handle this. Yeah, <laughs> that would be traumatic. It is a like bit a inconsistent movie. with the tone of the rest of the <laughs> cutesy wootsy, you know, yeah. kind of thing they're going for. Yeah, yeah, up to that point in the film, like it feels very safe. Like this is a kid's film. And then it's like, oh, he just swallowed somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like that. And it's like a prolonged thing, too. He's like kind of like. <laughs> and it's like you're watching him digest yeah. this this yeah. living thing. They had to put in the close up before that of the of the you know they uh, make you empathize with it before they do that. It's like you're gonna do it. Just don't let me don't make me connect and do it first. Like, like they get a wide shot. They had to have like known that it was gonna traumatize kids. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because like when they do that in a kids movie, there's like a way to do it without it seeming too like jarring and making it earned. Like you know if you want to establish a threat and make it seem scary and more adult but that one like kind of came across more like a cheap shock value yeah, <laughs> yeah. personally value. you know yeah yeah well <laughs> didn't feel earned <laughs> yeah well the the next species that we see in the film uh are the what i assume are tyrannosaurus rexes mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on that i know you mentioned the teeth the exposed yeah, yeah. teeth I, I guess uh with one of them they had like a closed mouth lips covering the teeth the other ones uh I guess to make them look different, they had teeth sticking out when their mouths are closed. That's Mm. uh, an easy mistake to make uh, because I think that what that originally comes from is the association with like crocodiles, Mm. which, you know, 
think of them as dinosaur-like and they have teeth sticking out, but you know, there's, there's a reason for that. And it's because, uh, the thing about teeth is that you can't expose them like to dry air for too long. That's not very healthy for them. It kind of ruins them, which is why we have lips and we produce, you know, spit in our mouths to yeah. keep them moist. Uh, with crocodilians, there's kind of an exception that proves the rule because they live in swamps and humid areas. So the moisture is already there. So they're able to do that. Yeah. But uh, T-Rexes are terrestrial animals. So probably best to just follow the rule of thumb uh, with uh, animals when depicting them and just keeping their uh, lips covering their teeth. I know it looks more fearsome when they do it like that way, which may also be an influencing factor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just one of those little things where they could have done a little more research into that and it might have shown some attention to detail. But other than that, the other big thing that they do with this uh, is another common mistake where they mess up the arms and hands of the two-legged dinosaurs. They Mm -hmm. give them this sort of praying mantis sort of pose where they're arms and their fingers and hands are tucked up uh-huh. underneath their bodies, which is not physically possible uh, for uh, dinosaurs like T-Rex. Their wrists were not as flexible as a primate hand. They mm. could only have their hands uh, with the palms facing towards each other. So <laughs> that was, yeah, it's a, it's again, it's a little detail, maybe not that significant, but it's a common mistake that uh, you see in a lot of dinosaur movies, Jurassic Park does it. Uh, They Mm. do this with the raptors too, but their hands uh, would be facing each other and not as movable as ours would be. You know? Yeah, but it's still small though. That's like yeah, tiny. yeah, they, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the proportions again. They do the cartoony <laughs> thing with this one. Their uh, tails are a bit short. Their feet can be a bit blocky. Some of them. I think the female T Rex was probably the most accurate one mm. in there. But yeah, there's some some weird stuff in there. One thing I do like that um, they uh, included with this is they kind of played with this idea that they're they all suffered these really awful injuries that they just kind of like mm. uh, dealt with. Like one guy got bit in the face by a crocodile and yeah. he still has a tooth in his gum, <laughs> which is oh, messed up. Yeah. But you know, that's, you know, reptiles are, have way tougher immune systems than mammals per se. So it's very likely that there'd be T-Rexes with really horrific injuries that could still function. There's skeletons that show that. The famous one uh, from Chicago, Sue the T-Rex, had some serious leg injuries, rib injuries, and uh, there's signs of rehealing showing that she, you know, survived some pretty nasty stuff. So I do appreciate that they included that kind of thing. But That's interesting. I'm not entirely sure if that was research-based or if they just wanted to (laughs) make them look tough uh, as characters, but... Yeah, you know, you need to worth. you need to make the make him match Sam Elliott's voice. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta make him look like he's been through some stuff. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. that that Western vibe is strong in this movie, and uh, for sure. And I, I wanted to ask too. They like galloped. They ran kind of funny. Yeah, it was really weird. The whole movie they're trying to do this um, farmer and rancher vibe to yeah, it. Yeah, it's a which Western. I, you know, yeah. I feel like they could have done that like for a few characters or whatever. Like in. I, I know I keep saying this, like going back to Finding Nemo, they have a lot of diversity with the personalities of all these uh, creatures that they meet. You know, they've got the sharks that are Alcoholics Anonymous parodies, and yeah. they've got the sea turtles that are supposed to be like the stereotypical surfer, surfer dude. dude yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> with this one, they're they're all just you know like American Westerners. It's yeah. you know, yeah. it's, so it's kind of gets the shtick gets old pretty quick. <laughs> There's also another thing I was talking about with the speculating on an alternate evolution thing is uh the t-rex is having a whole bunch of just straight up you know long horns like steers that they're herding Herding. big mammals like that probably wouldn't evolve into those kinds of niches if the cretaceous extinction hadn't happened because uh again it's the whole uh competition thing in nature if an animal is already occupying a certain niche then it's already been filled and another animal can't uh, evolve and fill it as well. So like being big grazers on open plains, dinosaurs used to have species that were in that sort of role and they've got these big cattle uh, nowadays that Hmm. uh, do the same thing. You can't really have both. Uh, There's 
it, if the two species are competing with each other, w- inevitably one's going to win and outlast the other, depending on who's the fittest. So uh, humans probably would not exist in this alternate timeline where the big dinosaurs are still around. So, you know, it's a fantasy story. I can yeah. sort of let it go. But sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just something to keep in mind. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last dinosaur that we have not yet talked about is the Velociraptor. And I guess they fill the role that you were talking about with everyone being a stereotype from a Western. Howdy partner. Yeah. yeah they are <laughs> They are the cattle rustlers. <laughs> so they were uh, Velociraptors? I'm going. I, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Honestly, okay. they, there's some kind of raptors for sure. Okay. Uh, the So the group that Velociraptors belong to is the Dromaeosaurs. And those were the bird-like ones that had, uh, you know, the famous sickle-shaped claws on their toes. And they're shown in a hunting pack in this one, which is a an old theory that's not uh, entirely outdated. It's uh, there's this is an interesting thing because uh, because of the popularity of Jurassic Park, a lot of people will assume. That it's just a known fact that dromaeosaurs hunted in packs like wolves. It's actually not entirely confirmed. It's a theory that's based on this old fossil discovery where a group of dromaeosaurs called Deinonychus were found all together in a group around a larger prey dinosaur called Tenontosaurus. And one possibility is that all of these dinosaurs were in a pack and they were hunting this prey animal together. And that's why they were all here at the same time. Mm. That's not conclusive, but it's an idea that caught on. And now it's kind of infected popular culture with it. There's still some study ongoing. There's, um, I don't remember what state this is going on in, but there's a fossil bed that's still being excavated with a whole bunch of dromaeosaurs called Utah raptors. It might be Montana. It might have been Utah. I'm not sure. Uh, You know, the name obviously kind of makes me think it must be Utah, but uh, it'll hopefully provide more insight into whether or not that theory is true. Hmm. But anyway, it's not too inaccurate to show them like this in the movie, but there's a lot of uh, uh, inaccuracies with their designs because it is nice that they've got, uh, they put feathers on them because that's uh, something that's taken a while for pop culture to catch up with. We now know that... uh, dinosaurs uh, a lot of dinosaurs had feathers on them especially dromaeosaurs which were heavily feathered this is something that's been known since like the 90s probably because jurassic park was so popular it kind of established this uh, standard look of lizard-like velociraptors but the uh, extent of the feather covering was like almost a maximum because they had uh, full-on wings they were covered pretty much head to toe and with the raptors in this movie, it's just kind of, I guess they were trying to make them look mangy, but it's very, very minimal on there. And there would be way more. They'd look like just walking birds, basically. Mm-hmm. So, it doesn't look as uh, ferocious, which, you know, it's probably why not a lot of them do that. Uh, not, not a lot of movies show them that way. Well, speaking of birds, what other animals did you have thoughts on did you did anything else stick out to you i know we touched on the the cobra and a few other things it's actually kind of disappointing again that they didn't do more with this concept because there's a lot of really unique animals that would have stuck around uh if the cretaceous extinction hadn't happened and a lot of ones that aren't uh as well known as sort of these uh basic icons that most people know about because like again what i was saying before it it kind of feels like they just took whatever dinosaurs that uh non-experts would know about and they just yeah. portrayed them the way they think that they uh would look like based on pop culture uh mm. influencing their their memory of them But yeah, like I said, there's pterosaurs that could stand up taller than giraffes and had huge beaks and would eat small dinosaurs. There's a whole bunch of uh, a variety of crocodilians that Mm. were not semi-aquatic, some that were fully aquatic. Uh, There's ones that like lived in deserts and... I'm not sure how much opportunity they'd have for like ocean creatures in this particular kind of story, but uh, there's ammonites, there's mosasaurs and a whole bunch of sea reptiles. And there's this idea that uh, they wouldn't all probably look exactly the same as they would back in the Cretaceous if they survived into modern day because, you know, like I said before, climate changes and the types of plants and available resources change. 
and animals have to change in order to survive on what they can. Like, for example, now uh, we have uh, huge plains of grass, which didn't exist at the time of dinosaurs, and Mm. grass is actually a very difficult plant for an animal to extract nutrients from. Uh, Humans couldn't do it if uh, we put grass into our uh, bodies. It would pass through our stomachs pretty much unchanged, and we wouldn't be able to convert any energy out of it. So that's why grazing animals like sheep uh, have, you know, multiple stomachs. They have to digest the same material over and over again, and that's how they're able to do it. So there's this idea, could dinosaurs have possibly uh, evolved to do the same thing, or would they not be able to adapt, and would they die out uh, when that change inevitably happened? Uh, There's other things uh, that could have been touched on. This also, I think, could have been interesting because they are having these cartoonishly, you know, sentient dinosaurs with farms and, you know, lifestyles and stuff. And they could have done more with how these quadrupedal uh, 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 apatosauruses would run a farm on their own. But basically, they just had it be like a normal human farm. They had oh, okay. them growing wheat and sprinkling it. And for reasons I cannot understand, they have a chicken coop. <laughs> Even though they're they're <laughs> vegetarians, they're not going to eat these chickens. They're not going to eat their eggs. Yeah, I was wondering about I that. I really like, what, don't what? understand why they have a chicken coop. <laughs> yeah, what was he doing? Like, in the beginning, he was doing yeah. a chore. What was he doing? He was feeding, feeding the chickens. Yeah, okay. he was just feed- why are they? Maybe they're pets? Why? But what purpose do they the, serve? Also, uh, I felt like the chickens were really strange because they just looking. looked... I, 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 you've already touched on this, but I just wanted to make my own comment. Like Mm -hmm. the weirded me out that the dinosaurs look like, you know, dinosaur, like what we think of as dinosaurs, but all the other animals that could look familiar, despite Mm -hmm. the fact that this supposedly takes place like in our, like an alternate timeline, but Mm -hmm. in, in around this time, Mm -hmm. all the animals still look like prehistoric versions of themselves. Yeah. So that just, to me, like, like that's a prehistoric chicken, but it's also today. Mm-hmm. So how, like, how does that work? Anyways, but no, that kind of leads into the next question, which I, we wanted to get your take on where you think this movie takes place. Cause obviously there's an alternate timeline. We can't know for sure, but mm-hmm. did you have any pick up on any clues as to um, where and when do you think this is set? All would they really tell us is it's like millions of years. <laughs> yeah. Later. That too. I was puzzled by that. I mean, if they've got essentially uh modern humans or paleolithic humans i'm going to assume it's supposed to be present day but you know uh i I, as far as location i think it's kind of clear they were going for this uh american west there's some stuff that looks like uh yellowstone sort Hmm. of they've come across Hmm. these bubbling volcanic uh fields at a certain point so i was like okay it's i mean kind of goes with what they're going with this cowboys and ranchers uh set up i was i was wondering because they yeah. they also mention well like we see there's like gophers but then there's leeches and i was like would yeah. leeches <laughs> yeah, be the, found in the it, same in this crystal clear blue pond yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> would there be leeches in like the same vicinity as a gopher i'm trying to think where in the world that would be <laughs> um we also get a hint when butch is that's the sam elliott's t-rex character yeah. when butch is, is is telling the story of his scar he, he mentions that he walked for Five days with no water in mm-hmm. like a hundred degree heat, mm-hmm. and I'm like, okay, well that sounds like a desert. And then he immediately encounters a crocodile. So I'm like, okay, is that like Florida? Like, <laughs> yeah, they don't do a whole lot with the world building that they. Could, yeah, know? I mean, you know, like I said, there's crocodilians from prehistoric times that uh, had that were in way more ecological niches than just living in swamps. So okay. you know, there could have been crocodilians in the desert attacked him but we don't see any of those and that could have been pretty mm. cool to play around with the idea but uh yeah for sure they yeah i i you know i just you know because finding nemo is an easy example to use you know they've they give all these different uh creatures their own culture and their own uh lifestyles and stuff you know there's the fish in the tank and they sort of have a lot of gags with uh, the one guy being obsessed with the bubble making uh decor well, yeah. fish was, tank. Was... <laughs> and they have the uh, you know those fish that assemble themselves into <laughs> shapes and stuff oh and yeah they play around with the turtles uh, riding the east australian current and yeah 
they could have done a lot more, I mm-hmm. felt, with uh, the ideas that they opened up for themselves with this uh, premise. Yeah. But, you know, it's... Well, uh, talking about the Apatosauruses, mm-hmm. and you mentioned them farming. So the Apatosauruses, they, you know, they spray water to, like, yeah. to, for the, uh, like, an industrial sprinkler. They also, mm-hmm. they chop down trees with their tails. They are digging trenches. Like, mm-hmm. wh- wh- how much of that do you think is possible? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, I mean, their noses were not designed for shoveling stuff. I mean, I could see... You know, it's a possible idea they could play around with them evolving to shovel up dirt and stuff. Like, uh, you know, there's definitely animals that uh, do that uh, to, like, look for grubs underground or stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not so sure herbivores would do that. But uh, as far as the farming goes, like, I'm not sure it's entirely necessary for this small little family of five uh, to grow crops and stuff uh even if they do have winter around but, but do, you, do you think it's like biologically possible that they could have been able to spray water like a industrial sprinkler <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't know i mean it's a cartoon thing i can yeah. see what they were going for I, I i don't know if this is relevant but this really drove me crazy that whole section where arlo is struggling to find food and is looking for these berries it's like just eat the freaking trees around you, dude. Like you're, oh, yeah. you're in a pedosaurus. Like oh, there's they eat leaves. And yeah, stuff. there's <laughs> pine trees. Like there's this is the exact stuff that but, you would be. But eating. But then there would be no movie. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So put them in a different environment. Put them in a desert or something. I could just see Anders walking through the Pixar animated studios and just being like shaking his head, like no, <laughs> no. So uh, so one one question I had for you, uh, Anders, when watching this movie. So I, I, we see a portrayal of an apatosaurus uh, like befriending t-rexes now you can comment <laughs> you can comment on how unrealistic or realistic that would be but i specifically wanted to see if you would talk about how this movie disrupts the stereotype that tyrannosaurus rexes are bad guys and like can you think <laughs> of any other movies that kind of disrupt that stereotype yeah, I thought that was pretty cool that they did. They did something unexpected there. You know, we're scared of these T-Rexes, and it yeah. looks like they're going to eat them, but then one reaches down a hand and, like, <laughs> helps them up. Yeah, um, I, I I don't know. I mean, it's a fantasy world where every every creature, or not every creature, but, like, they, they're all talking, so yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll buy it. You know, I can buy Simba getting along with Timon and Pumbaa fine. So, you know, it's, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, um, but yeah, the T-Rex is not being the stereotypical bad guys was uh, an interesting little touch on there. Yeah. I don't know of any others that uh, do that. I guess there's that, that one old cartoon I only saw once, like we're back a dinosaur story. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, uh, but I guess they have a reason for that one because uh, they altered their genetics to make them all docile and cartoony. So yeah, <laughs> I, I had thought of Warback, and then the only other one that I could think of, and I can't remember how he was portrayed, but there's a T Rex in Meet the Robinsons. Oh yeah, that. Oh was. yeah, <laughs> and I think that he ended up being a good guy. I don't remember. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, I think he did. But it's end. always an outside force causing them to you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. be good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just for for the record, uh, those were my favorite characters. So that's why I wanted to ask that question because I'm like, I, I kind of like Sam Elliott as a T-Rex being a good guy. Like that's just, to mm-hmm. me, that was one of the little nuggets of awesomeness of this very weird, bizarre movie. <laughs> yeah, that was, there were some cool moments there. Like, like, father, like father figure he plays. And, mm-hmm. But yeah, could T-Rexes and the Petosaurs even get along or would they hunt them, right? Like immediately? That's the other thing is like, weirdly enough, like a Petosaurus, Petosauruses were extinct way before the Cretaceous extinction, and they would not have coexisted with T. Rexes anyway. So oh, it's uh, okay. there were other sauropods that lived uh, around the same time, so hmm. they probably would have eaten them. So <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> no, be honest; they're predators. Just, they're 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 op, you know carnivores. They're opportun- <laughs> they're opportunistic. They'll they never know where their your next meal is gonna come from when you're out in nature. So yeah. if you see you see something moving, you're gonna eat it. You know if mm. you're a predator. Yeah. yeah. Can we talk a little bit also about, I know you're a dinosaur expert, not necessarily a human expert, <laughs> yeah. uh, but <laughs> talk a little bit about Spock, because there's some some interesting capabilities that he has in this. Like, he, he bites a, a hole out of the wing of one of the pterosaurs, and then yeah. he he's also able to track the longhorns by scent. 
So yeah. did you have any comments about that? Yeah, it's it's clear they were just trying to force like humans to be dogs or wolves in this. Like they howl and stuff. And it's yeah. like, is that the best, you know, the most creative thing you can come up with here is like, why not have the them actually be cave people with tools like hunting the dinosaurs and they're like more mortal enemies besides them just being pests that raid the farms like, you know, rats or mice, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, humans really don't have that good of a sense of smell for tracking stuff like that. And even in this movie, his olfactory systems, like, doesn't look all that different from a regular human, so I just couldn't see it. Yeah. And it was just a weird choice. Yeah, because he looks like a normal human, but then he walks on all fours, and he makes it look so easy, and you're like... You get on all fours and you're like, uh, no, this doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> not even like a hu- not even like a primate on all fours, like walking on his knuckles either. Just <laughs> like <laughs> like a like a dog. Yeah, <laughs> Just- yeah. Well, and so th- that begs the question too. Like, is it possible that caveman era humans like could theoretically develop the skills of maybe scent tracking or walking on all fours? Because because they. The family, you know, at the yeah, end, yeah. they choose when they want to do it, which is interesting. Sometimes mm-hmm. they walk on all fours, sometimes they walk upright. And mm-hmm. so what what I'm theorizing is, like, we don't know what humans are possible of, like, over mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. So, like, could could theoretically a human, yeah, develop walking on all fours and scent tracking? Like, is that even possible? I, I mean, I'm sure it's anything's possible, but there have to be reasons for why creatures uh, evolve uh, to be a certain way because of environmental pressures that force them to adapt uh, to that sort of lifestyle. Sure. So yeah. in order for that to become a norm, the norm for what humans do, it would have to become a desirable trait that uh, gets favored and uh, eventually becomes normal mm. over time. So I guess, obviously, having a good sense of smell can help an animal survive uh, in an environment where he has to determine which foods are safe to eat. Color vision, for example, helped is uh, the reason why that uh, is in people, but not a whole lot of mammals, is because it's it's helpful with uh, discerning what foods, what fruits, mm-hmm. or uh, what things all around us are safe to eat, and what's rotten per se, you know, yeah, something like that. And also night vision uh, going out of humans, uh, whereas um, a lot of monkeys can still see at night, uh, is a difference in lifestyle uh as well sure so but as far as like walking on all fours i i can't really see how that would be as beneficial like because <laughs> humans walk upright because it gives them you know just naturally a better vantage point you know right. you can uh see your surroundings better you can look out for danger better and walking on all fours or having uh, your face close to the ground, sniffing like that, you know, like I said before, something that eats grubs or like uh, food that's close to the ground, that'd be a reason to have that sort of trait. I don't really get the sense that that's the case with the humans in this one. They still yeah. just eat regular uh, meat and fruits and berries. So, mm, yeah. like, he attacks this poor lizard that in one scene and, like, shakes yeah. it like a dog. So, yeah. you know, the, it's weird because they – didn't one of the – didn't, the, like, the main caveman uh, in that family have, like, a spear – or something so like indicating remember. that they do have tool use so like why is he uh, using his mouth to kill <laughs> kill animals to kill prey yeah you know oh well, that was that was odd, uh, honestly another scene that i felt was kind of messed up to have it in kids movie yeah. <laughs> which one the lizard when when he oh, he's yeah. like shaking the lizard like a dog and yeah. then he puts it down he's and like the breathing. lizard's just heavily yeah. breathing. breathing like this poor thing <laughs> yeah there was an aspect i feel like in the in the movie in general of this like trying to brutally portray like survival you know mm-hmm. and, to, and it's like this again this is a kids movie yeah you've got like uh just just some weird stuff like yeah like the bug the bug gets decapitated yeah. too and then there's the there's of course the drug tripping scene yeah which is like pretty messed up for a kids movie but also it's like if they're going for this like like you know what what could really happen you know yeah so i, I get it but it's also just like sometimes they're, i think they're i think they're going for this like realistic vibe and like the tear of like trying to survive a little too much. <laughs> it's a mm-hmm. kids movie. Yeah, a but it clashes much. with the design of the creatures that are supposed to be all like, cartoonish. And yeah. So it just doesn't work. Yeah. And, yeah. Also, with the drug scene, I don't think they went far enough. Like, 
go go full pink elephants like, <laughs> if, if you're gonna do it <laughs> yeah. go crazy well uh speaking of character design we did want to ask you before we move on to talking about your youtube channel and stuff we wanted to know did you have a favorite design like character design in this movie um or maybe least favorite. <laughs> maybe <laughs> least favorite. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, um, I guess the you know, the ceratopsid with all the things ri- uh, riding on him uh, was probably my favorite character in there. I okay. do like uh, his personality. Also, <laughs> is kind of funny because of how gloomy he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is Dream Crusher. He protects me from having unrealistic goals. <laughs> <laughs> was probably the only joke in the movie that actually made me laugh. <laughs> um, oh yeah. <laughs> this is Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Debbie, no, you're better than. <laughs> and there's like a is it like a fennec fox named destructor yeah <laughs> Debbie, no. why couldn't this guy have been the main character that yeah. you know that too like uh this story is like uh someone else like i've seen other reviewers make this uh criticism is like why is every dinosaur movie just the plot of like he a dinosaur has to go from point A to point B. <laughs> and like, no. that's the plot. It's like, couldn't we do more with this concept of, you know, yeah, I, this is just something that, uh, dinosaur movies tend to have, I guess, yeah. because it's a formula that works. <laughs> mm-hmm. We did, before we wrap up the interview, we did want to talk a little bit about your YouTube channel. So yeah. How did you get started on YouTube? See, I was making videos before uh, I got onto YouTube just because they had, you know, my parents' uh, camcorder and stuff and uh, doing stop motion stuff with toys for for the fun of it. Mm. Then I did posting stuff on YouTube and finding uh, other people who made uh, similar kinds of videos. You know, it was a whole community of similar interest people uh, yeah. back in back when I was doing that. And so I uh, saw some toy movies and like just videos in general on YouTube that were really ambitious and tried to like make full length films out of stuff. And I was like, I bet I could probably do something like that. That would be a lot of fun. So I made a couple of those along with just some shorter stuff for fun. And those were the most popular videos that I've made so far. So how, how long ago was it that you launched your channel? Uh, 2008. So okay, it was a while back. Yeah. <laughs> so you were like young back then. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. In 2008, I would have been like 14, I think. So, wow. Yeah. So for listeners who don't know, we're we're millennials. Just just <laughs> FYI. Um, <laughs> uh, we're old. What? Why the name Hoops and Dino Man? Where did that come from? Oh yeah. Um. So yeah, we were trying to come up with some name for our, our YouTube channel, meaning me and my younger brother Nico. And um, back uh, when we were in like I think it was preschool, or it might have been a little later, or just at daycare or whatever. Um, they had a day where everybody was like making tie dye shirts, and they put like a fake team name or last name on the back with a number underneath it, like a sports uniform Mm -hmm. and it was just like stuff that the individual kid really liked and stuff nico was really into basketball and i was always into dinosaurs so i I think we were like absent that day or at least i was so they just made one for us based on what the teachers knew we liked and so um he got uh hoops on the back of his uh fake sports uniform i got dino man on the back of mine (laughs) for (laughs) some reason that information stayed with me and that's just what i went with for (laughs) when i made the channel because we used to share it uh we don't anymore it's like not as practical Uh, i mean i know you guys have idiot boxes your group channel but you know everybody having their own is just kind of the way it is now but well well, hoops and dino man is a very memorable name like it it kind of has a catchiness to it so yeah Yeah, it it. just works out i guess and hoops (laughs) dino man is is party of one Mm -hmm. so but your brother is is, does he do his own stuff now or yeah nico's uh he mostly does uh streaming stuff now he just goes by neeks on twitch which is n-e-e-k-s okay. he does a lot of rocket league videos too so he still has a, a youtube channel but yeah, that's mostly where he does uh that's mostly what kind of stuff he does now okay shout out for neeks <laughs> well, well tell, tell us a little bit about the um the different kind of content that you do on your channel and also just kind of like like the why behind it too you know like why, why dinosaurs why all this you know it's a uh, <laughs> 
it's it's a question for sure that I'm not really sure how to describe why I like uh, dinosaurs so much, but it's just uh, an interesting thing that appeals to me as it's it's very intellectually stimulating to think about stuff like biology and uh, evolution, and uh, it's something that I can get creative with, especially since there's uh, with dinosaurs in particular, or just extinct animals in particular, there's a lot of unknown factors uh, with uh, regards to appearance or behavior and things like that. So dinosaur-related art is something that requires uh, the artist to put a lot of thought into why they're making a certain decision about a portrayal or an appearance. And like I said, it's a stimulating kind of experience. You can uh, put a lot of uh, research into filling in gaps in what's unknown. There's actually this thing called uh, phylogenetic bracketing, which basically means uh, if there's an unknown aspect of an extinct or prehistoric animal, scientists will try to look at modern animals that it's closely related to or occupy a similar ecological niche and make inferences from that. So pretty obvious example is like skin covering. Uh, mostly it's just skeletons that get found, but uh, the bones of dinosaurs uh, were similar to birds and reptiles. And so that's why uh, scaly dinosaurs became uh, pretty widely accepted. Hmm. Uh, way back in like the 1800s, when dinosaurs were first being discovered, the original like teeth and you know little bones and not full skeletons being found, scientists just assumed that they were large uh, lizard-like reptiles, based on the fact that their the structure of these bones and uh, the function of the teeth, which were like sharp and clearly predatory, hmm. uh, matched up with stuff like lizards and stuff like that. So. Oh, sure. That's why uh, the original dinosaur depictions were like that. And nowadays, there's a lot more stuff that's known, but there's still a lot of gaps that you can sort of uh, fill in using your imagination. Some, some of it's a bit of you know, artistic liberty. Some of it's just you know, putting in uh, actual research into facts and stuff. Mm -hmm. So getting back to my YouTube channel, what I try to do with uh, my claymation uh, videos when designing my creatures, I want to give a new angle to them most of the time that I haven't seen uh, explored before. Uh, so for example, uh, when I did my, the, the first big one I did was the Triceratops and I wanted to show it as uh, like scratching its horns on trees to like either sharpen them or just, you know, to mark its territory. And I base that off of animals like deer or uh, rhinos, they do that uh, when they're patrolling their territories. The males will try to do that. Mm -hmm. And I also uh, did something with uh, my Stegosaurus uh, when I was trying to figure out coloration for that one. I came across this whole really interesting uh, aspect about biology where animals' coloration can sometimes be determined by the things that they eat mm -hmm. because. There are two kinds of ways that can determine an animal's color. There's melanin, which animals can produce naturally in their bodies, and that has some colors that are available that can be produced by melanin. And then there's carotenoids, which uh, have a different uh, ensemble of colors. Usually those ones are brighter than what can be accomplished with melanin. And carotenoids exist in things like algae and uh, plants and flowers and stuff. So. If you look at something like hummingbirds, they get their bright, shiny colors from the flowers that they pollinate. Another, like an obvious example is uh, flamingos get their pink feathers from the brine shrimp that they eat. And those shrimp uh, eat red algae. So they ingest uh, those carotenoids into their bodies and that's where the coloration in their feathers comes from. So when I was doing my Stegosaurus, uh, I was looking into like what kinds of plants existed that this dinosaur would have eaten and it ate cycads, was a big part of its diet and there are pictures I found that have shown that like cycads have these like seed pods that are sort of red and yellow and uh, black and brown. So I tried to make the plates on the Stegosaurus's back sort of look like that. And so 
Supposedly, it's getting carotenoids from these cycads that it's eating. That goes into the colors on these display features on the body. And that's a, a really fun little process for me. And that's something that I try to do with my videos. Great, man. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Behavioral stuff is pretty good, too. I like looking at videos of animals doing things that you might not know about and uh, trying to put that in my videos, too. Uh, like taking, and animals will take mud baths to get rid of uh, flies and stuff and rub against rocks and to get rid of parasites. So just, you know, things that seem kind of familiar if you've seen it in nature before, but maybe you don't necessarily know where you've seen it before, but it'll feel right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but on the topic of movies, because you've made some actual narrative stories on your yeah. channel, too. Uh, I wanted to ask, like, from Jurassic Park to The Land Before Time, dinosaurs have long been a popular subject for film. So as a dino filmmaker mm -hmm. um, yourself, what do you think it is that makes dinosaurs such magnetic subject material for stories? I think a big part of it is... Uh we have a humans are naturally curious and there's a mystery in uh, something that is sort of, I don't know if unobtainable is the word, but uh, difficult to fully uh, understand mm -hmm. and stuff that's in the past, whether that's, you know, fossils or just human history or certain time periods that are very different from our own can be very interesting to learn about. And I also think that a big part of it is the size of uh, the biggest dinosaurs can make us feel, you know, pretty small and uh, powerless. Mm -hmm. And there's a fascination with looking at things like mountains or big landscapes that make us feel that way. And there's also, um, I think this may not necessarily be as true anymore, but the association of dinosaurs with reptiles and uh, reptiles, you know, scaring people because of how different they are and how cold blooded and kind of unnerving they, they are in popular consciousness. Mm. You know, people are afraid of snakes. They think of reptiles as slimy, as, even though they probably aren't. That's amphibians. <laughs> reptiles yeah. have dry scales, but... I think that that also gives dinosaurs a monstrous sort of vibe to them that people are drawn to because it's exciting, because it's scary. Mm -hmm. Obviously, nowadays, there's a new perceptions of dinosaurs being associated with birds and stuff. But that's definitely a big part of uh, the roots of yeah. the fascination and why they make for good uh, good movie monsters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what is your favorite dinosaur movie? Uh, well... I don't know if it counts. It has dinosaurs in it. Um, Fantasia is my favorite movie. And uh, that whole dinosaur sequence uh, that's in the middle there, I think, is something that I really enjoy studying because mm -hmm. uh, it's very atmospheric and it's very, you know, very well animated for one thing. Oh, yeah. But it also has this, it kind of embodies this thing I was talking about earlier about old dinosaur portrayals sort of have this uh, vibe to them. I don't know, it just, just has a really interesting tone to it. You know, when I really tried to pin it down and put it into words, uh, there's stuff like music choices. They use The Rite of Spring by Stravinsky in that sequence. And uh, I tried to look at, like, what instruments are used in there most frequently, what instruments are not in there. And there's also, like, the color palette that they used in there. There's uh, been different uh, prints of that movie mm -hmm. over the years, but uh, I grew up with the VHS one, which has a lot of just the black of the dinosaurs contrasted with yellow skies or blue skies or sometimes purplish stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's this whole thing with, I think the term is affinity. It's it's very difficult to put it into words, but it's, it's something that fascinates me. And I try to capture that uh, with my videos as well. Mm -hmm. I think uh, um, other than that, though, Another dinosaur movie I like, Jurassic Park, is Classic. one of those movies. <laughs> the, OG, the OG, right? Yeah, yeah. Not well, <laughs> what I was saying about trying to do something different with dinosaurs by looking at what animals do and trying to incorporate that into the portrayals is something that the people who worked on that movie really emphasized a lot on. Because yeah, that was one of the first movies I watched the behind-the-scenes documentary for. Mm. And they wanted to portray dinosaurs as realistic animals instead of just monstrous. So there's always a reason behind every action that they take. Mm 
Mm. Uh, there's like the scene of the velociraptors in the kitchen. They paid a lot of attention to like, uh, what, what are they going to look at first now that they're in this environment they've never been in before. So they're kind of like sniffing and scanning everything and being all curious. Mm. There's, uh, the T-Rex scene when it attacks the car, it's sort of playing around with it, uh, as a predator like a cat or a dog would do just uh, for play fighting with it because mm, yeah. it's just something that you know they're naturally inclined to do so it just kind of rolls the car over attacks its belly and it's sort of a playful uh, sort of way for it that is obviously very terrifying for the people below but yeah. you can sort of tell it's just being animalistic yeah. and the people just happen to be in the way it's not just terrorizing people because the script demands it you know yeah, yeah. yeah. well you got Spielberg so it's, yeah, yeah. You know, you're in good hands <laughs> there so. yeah but that's yeah that I think uh, is a good movie to look to for dinosaur portrayals. There are of course, you know, things that haven't aged too well with the obviously there's no feathers on dinosaurs that are now known to be feathered, so it's certainly uh worth, you know, like really looking into if you want to use that as a reference. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also modern not necessarily movies, but uh paintings or just pictures in general drawn by artists who are also paleontologists I think are very very inventive and there's a lot of thought put in there and it's kind of created this because it's on the internet this uh, system that rewards uh, being unique and being original and stuff like that and I think that kind of helps with creative thinking uh, Mm -hmm. with uh, what they try to do with these uh, modern day uh, artistic portrayals of dinosaurs because there's this book that I really uh, would recommend uh, for anybody who's doing what I'm doing that's called All Yesterdays that uh, is a compilation of a bunch of artworks by paleontologists who are also artists where they're specifically trying to do things that are weird with their dinosaurs that have never been done before like big example is on the cover they have a bunch of dinosaurs climbing a tree mm-hmm. that are like quadrupedal and they're doing it they're b- doing that based on like goats climbing trees which uh, is not something their bodies are designed for but they do it anyway just because they can yeah and so it's like could dinosaurs have done you know weird things like this that you wouldn't know about from looking at their bones and you know, there's a whole bunch of ideas like that being thrown around that i really like well, before we wrap up the interview, we did want to ask, since this is a Pixar podcast, and I feel like I might have a guess as to what the answer to this question is. <laughs> yeah, this movie what, did not do any of those things what, that I was mentioning before. What is your, uh, what is your favorite Pixar movie? My fa- that's a very tough one. I <laughs> I really don't know. I was um, gonna guess Finding Nemo because yeah, yeah. you've well, name dropped Finding Nemo like five uh, times in this podcast. Yeah, it is definitely one that's uh, you know <laughs> it makes a good contrast to this one for sure. Um, I. I, I, uh, he wasn't prepared for the question. <laughs> no, 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 abort! I abort! <laughs> no, I get it. No, it's fun. Um, I like A Bug's Life a lot, uh, mostly oh, for nice. personal reasons because I was like one of the first movies where I grew up with the whole process of you see the trailer then you go see it in the theater then you wait for it to come out Mm -hmm. and then you rent it or buy it it's like VHS so that kind of introduced me to that whole you know movie experience thing yeah I I like Incredibles as well I think the the fast pacing thing and the gags that they do in that are pretty cool yeah that's good that's good yeah well, to end the episode, we like to do a segment that we call... The Claw. <laughs> so The Claw is where we talk about, much like when you get a uh, stuffed animal out of a claw machine, uh, what did you get out of this viewing of this movie? What is your takeaway? We'll all share a little yeah, bit around yes. the table, but we'll let Anders start. What was your takeaway with this film? Well, my takeaway is that I could see the seams uh, i guess is the term because <laughs> i like i could tell that there i i wasn't really thinking about uh the movie as i was experiencing it i was thinking about the decisions that went into it or mm-hmm. lack thereof because like i don't think they uh did as much as they could have and basically i mean i guess it's uh, a movie that uh could ch- challenge you to do something better than what you see some movies are like that uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> 
But yeah, that's. I, I mean, I guess the the background animation is certainly very good. So I yeah. hope those animators get more work. Yeah, uh, I think that there's stuff <laughs> there's to love. stuff to learn from uh, what this movie did wrong that you can that uh, you could do better at uh, if you were watching this movie. Yeah, I know that's harsh, but you know. <laughs> yeah, no. Any what about the story? Was there, was there anything takeaways there story wise? Story wise, yeah. I think it was uh, very generic. I did not feel that there was a whole lot at stake during the whole chasing down the Longhorn herd. It was like. What exactly are they going to lose if they uh, don't manage to rustle up this herd? It's like the third act where the where Spot gets taken away by pterosaurs was the only time I felt there was ever any actual tension. Oh yeah, <laughs> and even then, it's yeah. only like structurally tension. I you know personally did not really care what happened to him, <laughs> but yeah. you know I, I didn't. I don't think they made me that attached to him. Yeah. as a character. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, sure. you know. Well, Ben, I wanted to know what your takeaway was with this viewing of the movie. Yeah. Before you share, I will say really quick that Ben and I both saw this movie uh, in theaters together uh, oh, like yeah. way back when it first came out. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure that before this week, that was the last time we both saw it. Correct? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I haven't seen it since. So, <laughs> so we saw this together in theaters and we both disliked it pretty strongly and we haven't spoken about the movie since we both rewatched it this week. So I'm really interested to hear uh, what you have to say, Ben, take it away. Yeah, no, it's right back at you. You know, I feel like this movie, you know, there's a couple other, you know, lower tier Pixar films out there. Uh, I would say, you know, Cars 2, it kind of falls in that bucket along with Good Dinosaur. So revisiting it, I was was actually excited. I mean, not only to speak with Anders, of course, (laughs) primarily, but like, just to be able to go back to a film that I remember being like, this is like weak sauce compared to, you know, all of Pixar's amazing catalog. So, yeah, I, I was looking forward to it. So, you know, overall, it, I think it's an okay film. But, you know, it's it's still low, lower tier Pixar. Did, that didn't change for me. There's um, definitely with the story, you know, there's, there's things they could have done it, differently. But, you know, I don't know. It, I kind of, it kind of grew on me a little bit. It's, it's still lower tier for me in, in my ranking, but... I don't know. There's there's a little bit of heart there. Uh, I could see what they were trying to do, and there were some moments. You know that there's there's some Pixar moments in there certainly, and uh, I think a scene that comes to mind is like the there's a scene with um, Spot and Arlo when they're on a beach area. Yeah, and it's the scene with the sticks in the sand. And yeah, they're communicating to each other loss of their families, and like that that was creative and it was touching. That felt like a Pixar moment, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, um, for sure. And so th- there's there's some moments there, and you know. Um, so as far as my take takeaway goes i mean i thought there was an interesting message that i think i'm still trying to suss out so maybe maybe you guys can help me with this but (laughs) i i was i was processing like hey like what what really is this film trying to say what they're trying to do i think they could have said better to make it easier to understand but certainly there's a lot about fear here arlo is you know the entire movie he's just scared you know he's a little wimpy and He's trying to conquer his fear. And so certainly there's this message of like, and even his dad talks about the, or uh, not his dad, the the T-Rex. Butch. By, Butch, yeah, the Sam. Sam, uh, Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. He, he even says, you know, like, you know, you can't get rid of fear, you know. You yeah. have to kind of live with it and it shows you who you are. And I feel like that's kind of, he's almost like speaking the message of the film of that, you know, you have to like, sometimes you have to just do things afraid. Like you can't, you can't get rid of fear. It's like, it's like, you know, it can like, help you with your purpose it can help you it can like fuel you in a way also uh the whole film starts and ends with these marks on on the silo right and i remember watching the movie and it went in the theater with you and at the end i was like that's it really he just had to get his mark on the silo like yes. what the heck and so but but this time i was like okay no okay what, what are they trying to do here like clearly there's this there's a purpose to this what's going on here and i i realized that i think what they were trying to say is that um, his Arlo's dad says that you can put your mark on the silo when you do something bigger than yourself. Okay, and so what he's getting at is like when you do something selfless, that's your mark. Okay, you're not just doing something cool like oh you chop down a tree, yeah, put your mark up. It's like no, you do something for that selfless. And if you think about his siblings, when Lily and Buck earn their marks, mm-hmm. they're at, they're doing something that's for the good of the family. If you think back to each time they, they, they earned their marks, they were doing something bigger than themselves. They were doing something selfless. And so, yeah, so all the marks are, are these selfless acts. So then I, I realized, like, oh, okay, like, maybe the message is that 
selflessness overcomes fear. So selflessness is what should ground you when you're afraid. And I and that made so much sense to me because there's the scene when Arlo's dad, when he when the storm comes and 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 then it and, you know he kills his dad. Um, that is uh, spoiler alert. Okay, spoiler alert. Sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I should have prefaced that. Spoiler alert. Big spoiler. Um, Twenty minutes in. <laughs> big spoiler. Twenty three nineteen. We've got a twenty three nineteen. We've got a spoiler leak. We've got a. Sp- That is uh, that scene. That same scene is mirrored when Spot is on the log. Spoiler alert! And the storm comes again. The same same kind of thing. The landslide um, comes towards Spot, and and in that moment you see Arlo is afraid, and almost for a second you think he's going to be afraid. He's not going to do anything. Mm-hmm. He's gonna, he's going to seize up like like with his dad. But then all of a sudden he sees Spot, and he's like, no. And then he runs and he jumps into that into it, you know. And then and and the whole and it hits him. And, you know, eventually, you know, you got to watch the film to see what happens. But in that moment, I was like, whoa, like Arlo, obviously that's a character moment for him, a big character moment where he jumps into the storm, but he's not just doing it to be like, I'm courageous. I'm jumping into the storm. He's doing it for spot. That's why he's, he's jumping in the storm. So what makes Arlo courageous is it, the, the selfless act, his love of spot. That's what gives him the courage. So anyways, all that to say, that took me a while to figure out that message and I was like, that that's actually kind of cool. So for me, I, I appreciate that takeaway and, and it helped me like the film a little bit more. So I just wow. want to say, I really <laughs> hope that no kid watches this movie and comes away thinking that there is anything to be gained from jumping into a, a wave of that proportion <laughs> just to save anybody. It's like, you cannot, uh, you know, outswim a <laughs> massive current like that. You will drown yourself and you cannot save the person. Maybe, is- maybe unless you're a, a potosaurus. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. If you're an apatosaurus. That was like a full review, Ben. <laughs> um, good job. I will say this movie shocked me. So oh, as as okay. I as I established before, I I did not like this movie. I would dare say I hated this movie. So okay. I was mentally prepared for agony going into this movie um but the parts of the story that i didn't think worked the first time i saw it completely and totally worked for me this time and i don't know why um arlo's character arc i hated it because i was like he's wimpy he doesn't really i kind of agreed with you i didn't think Hmm. he learned anything but in this i was like no there's definitely an arc there um the antagonist i did not like this time i was like well they they kind of work the slow pacing i didn't like this time i'm like it it works Hmm. the diverse cast of characters just somehow hit differently um seven years later i don't know why and the thing that i still hold against this film uh, is its troubled production history and the resulting confoundedness of the film's concept. Mm-hmm. Like, it, this movie did not need to be told with dinosaurs. It's a it's a coming-of-age survival western, and yes. that in of itself yeah. is convoluted enough. It didn't need to have the added, like, alternate timeline present day with dinosaurs. Like, <laughs> that just adds a yeah. whole other layer of convolutedness. Yeah. yeah, the premise... It's such a simple and elegant story. It didn't need all that. It didn't need to be dinosaurs, alternate timeline, blah, 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 blah. It's just, it's a coming of age, very simple, elegant, coming of age, uh, survival film told as a Western, which is pretty cool. But I could see the movie's bizarre eccentricities becoming more charming over time uh, and multiple rewatches. I will say in response to something Ben had shared, um, I kind of agree. I liked Arlo's arc better this time, but I still don't love the silo moment simply because Mm -hmm. the mom doesn't know everything that he went through and she's like mm-hmm. oh you earned your mark yeah. and in her mind she he had gone off to get rid of the critter and that was what was going to earn him his mark was killing the critter oh, so yeah. if you think about it too much it's like the ending is her rewarding her son with what he wants for because she thinks that he killed spot <laughs> and so that that to, that just it makes that moment slightly weird but it definitely still worked for me because i was like okay he definitely had a character arc and i think that he did earn his mark even if his mom didn't know that yeah the audience knows it and that's what's important (laughs) 
But finally, I just, I can't fault this movie because it portrays kindly dinosaurs with Sam Elliott and Al- <laughs> Anna Paquin voicing them. And it's just like, those characters I just thought were way too endearing yeah. to like, not like the movie significantly more than I did the first time. Yeah, the, the T-Rex, is, what, dude, I love those characters. And their friendship with Arlo, it, it's pretty great. Like, yeah. honestly, it's it's. Yeah, it's and, and, you, and you weren't wrong about also the beach scene. Total Pixar feels, but yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that was good. Your description of uh, the movie didn't need, uh, this story didn't need to have dinosaurs and a whole wasted concept plowed onto it, it kind of reminds me of After Earth, because like that's oh. also just a coming-of-age story, just the dad gets injured, kid has to go wander through the wilderness to find out. You didn't need this whole sci-fi, like post-apocalyptic world uh, slapped yeah. on that, because it didn't live up to that potential either, <laughs> So, yeah, that movie kind of reminded me of this, too. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Fair enough. Now it's time for... Two peps. We got two peps ready to go. We got we to gotta give this ratings and rankings. So, first of all, we don't know if you had time to prepare for <laughs> this. But, we're, yeah, what we normally do, Anders, is we give it a rating, certain number out of... 10 pizza slices, <laughs> and then we kind of rate it, or rank it, I should say, where it belongs amongst the 25 Pixar films. So who, who wants to start ratings and rankings? Anders, do you want to go first? I just not very good at boiling down a movie opinion to just a ranking out of 10. It's like, it's deeper than that. You know, my yeah. experience like can't be quantified with, well, that, if, if, if with you... a percentage, but you know, I will certainly try. Um, <laughs> I've, I, I used to do that whole, like give it an IMDB rating out of 10, but uh, I kind of like lost track of like how to do that in a systematic way. Uh, but I will say, I guess uh, there were parts of it that I, I liked, but the, lack of creativity kind of frustrated me a great deal so i i wouldn't call it unwatchable so i would probably go with a three out of ten okay (laughs) you've not done a a pixar ranking list correct no (laughs) okay well then then we'll just yeah we'll go ahead and move on send us your list though okay i will certainly put a lot of thought into (laughs) you know ranking them so before I uh, share my ranking, I just want to say Ben and I have been keeping our rankings for years, and this movie has always been second from the bottom. I won't spoil what the bottom is, but it has always held that spot, uh, which in this case is number 24 out of 25 Pixar films today. It is moving to number 21. Oh, nice. It, it bummed up quite a few spots. I like this movie uh, oh, a lot more than I did. Participation award. Yeah, a lot more than I did before. And uh, I'm giving this movie 6.5 out of 10 oh, pizza slices. Very nice. So uh, how about you, Ben? Mine was also number 24. You said you're right. You said second from the bottom. It used before. to be 24. Yeah, yep. So my, that's what mine was as well. And now mine is moved up to, to number 22. Oh, wow. So I moved up a couple slots. So just one slot under me. <laughs> and seven slices. Oh. So, it, it, so it's, yeah. It's, it balances out. <laughs> yeah. I have a higher rank, but you gave it more pizza. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're pretty close there. So. Awesome. Well, that was our discussion with uh, Hoops and Dynaman on the, uh, I just said Dynaman, like, <laughs> like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> no, D- Hoops and Dino Man. Dino, Dino guy, he had a great cape and the boots. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking of. Uh, but that was our discussion with Hoops and Dino Man on The Good Dinosaur. Thank you for listening, and we will see you again very soon. Go check out Hoops and Dino Man on YouTube. Smash that subscribe button and help give Anders some love. Um, also, if you haven't seen A Good Dinosaur, go check it out. It's on Disney Plus. To infinity. And beyond. I'm going to run you over when I come back down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> over onward. <laughs> what, what Pixar film is that from? That's Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just doing, I'm just playing up my brain. Hey, you're doing, your, you're doing your thing, man. <laughs> I was that not worked. expecting that. That worked.